I am Karen Ryan, the Carter Center's Senior Advisor for Human Rights and Special Representative on Women and Girls. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation at the Carter Center, Harmonizing Religion and Human Rights. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've got a great program for you and only 75 minutes to get it all in. So I'm going to skip the long introductions. I hope you don't mind. The uh, program has all of the details about our wonderful panelists, but I'll just tell you that um, on our far right, on my far right, your left, is Imam Omar Soleiman uh, of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. We welcome you. <laughs> and next to him is the Rabbi Jill Jacobs of Trua, the rabbinical call for human rights. We welcome you. And the man next to me obviously needs no introduction, former President Jimmy Carter. Um, <clears throat> well, before I delve into the topics, let me remind you to silence your phone. I'm going to do it. I'm going to lead by example. Um, everything off. You are free to keep your phones out and tweet and share on social media during the, the conversation. And please use the hashtag faith and human rights. Um, you can also submit your questions for the panel via Twitter. Or if you're here in the audience with us, there will be cards handed out. Um, and as long as you hand them to our staff by 740, they'll be collected cards and we'll try to get in as many questions as we can toward the end of the program. So let's get started. 70 years ago, on December 10th, that's next Monday, the newly formed United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, inspired by texts of major world religions, recognizing the equal dignity of every human being. Tonight we will explore contemporary challenges for the universal pursuit of human rights through the lens of faith. Religious faith can be a source of solace and joy, motiv motivating us to work for the betterment of ourselves, our families, our communities, and our nations, and the world at large. But religion has also become more polarized over the last 15 years, with extremist groups in many faiths becoming more emboldened in our secular democracy, we treasure and protect the separation of church and state, but we cannot ignore the influence of religion and religious arguments and movements in our country and in the wider world. We will explore both personal faith as well as public expressions of our faith through commitments to improve our world. So I'm going to start with a question for our panelists on personal faith. If you could each please speak about the connection between your personal religious faith and your work on behalf of human rights. And I'd like to start with you, President Carter. If you could begin uh, by reflecting on an idea that you addressed in your book. I'm not plugging, but yes, I am. Um, faith, A Journey for All, it's a marvelous book. If you don't have it, you must get it. Um, you, you address faith. What is faith in that book? Well, I worship the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. And um, I wrote the book about faith because we have so many different kinds of prevailing faiths in our life. We have faith in ourselves, we have faith in each other, we have faith in things like democracy or freedom or democracy. Or or human rights, we have faith in equality, we have faith in welcoming uh, immigrants, we have faith in uh, the basic principles of, uh, of our country, we have faith in, in the, I'd say, the combined uh, teachings of all the major religions, Hebrew, Hebrewism, Hebrew, Hebrewism and, and, uh, and Christianity and, and, uh, and others, Islam. And so I think that only one time in history have we ever gotten together as human beings and said, why don't we try to resolve the world's problems? 
And that was right after the Second World War when 60 million people almost were killed. We had the horrible uh, Holocaust that uh, let the Nazis assassinate many Jews, I think about 6 million Jews. So in compensation for that and to prevent that happening again, we organized the United Nations to try to preserve peace, and we organized the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We wrote that three years later uh, in order to make sure that everybody was treated equally. African Americans and, and, and uh, white people, uh, Jews and Christians and others, uh, and we also tried to make equal rights between men and women, and equal rights, I would say, in the treatment by government of people who were, had a disparity in, um, in income. The, the poor protected from the very rich, and the uh, people of color uh, in the imprisonment, things of all kinds. If you read the human rights, the 30 paragraphs in the Human Rights Declaration, uh, that was passed in, on the 10th of, G, of uh, December, you'll see that it was basically designed to, to guarantee equality of treatment by one another and also by governments to compensate for, for disparities in treatment. So, so that's the essence of, of human rights, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rabbi Jacobs. Thank you. First of all, thank you to President Carter and thank you to Karen for hosting this conversation here. It's really a privilege to be here. For me, my Judaism is what drives my commitment to work for human rights. I direct an organization, Trua, that mobilizes more than 2,000 rabbis in the US and Canada to work for human rights, to bring a moral rabbinic voice to human rights, both here at home and also in Israel and the occupied territories. And we do that out of the depth of our Judaism, out of the depth of our Jewish history and text and tradition. The very first thing that the Bible tells us about human beings is we're created in the image of God. That's the very first thing that we learn about ourselves. And that means that any injury to a human being is effectively an injury to God, and any attack on a human being is an assault on God. When the rabbis start talking about what this idea of Tselem Elohim, creation in the divine image, means, they, in the, in the Talmud and other rabbinic literature, they have this idea that actually when you damage a human being or, God forbid, when you kill a human being, you're diminishing God in the world. And that's unfortunately what we're doing all the time in our world, in every place, in every moment. But it's not enough to say that we as human beings, as creations in the image of God, deserve not to be attacked, deserve to be treated the way that we would treat and respect God. We also have obligations. Because it's very nice to say, nothing bad should happen to me or to any of us, but somebody has to be responsible for making sure that that is true. And so Judaism has the idea of chiyuv, of obligation, which means that we have obligations both toward God and then also toward one another. And the, the rabbis, again, in later books of law, create whole systems of trying to figure out how to create a just society in which everybody has a decent chance of living a dignified and a successful life. A lot of times when people think about Jewish law, they think about ritual law, what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you do on, on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, what you don't do, but actually there's whole areas of Jewish law that deal with every single aspect of what we would now call human rights, whether it's the relationship between workers and employers, whether it's questions of criminal justice, all of these very live issues of human rights are, are debated and discussed, and there are many, many attempts to figure out how we can ensure that everybody lives in a just society. So that's the first piece for me. And then second, I want to say a word about history. Judaism has a very long, several thousands of years of history, which for us, we're always living in the present moment. History is not something that happened in the past. It's very much alive in my community. And in our history, of course, the core narrative of the Torah is a story of the oppression in Egypt, slavery in Egypt, and the liberation from slavery. And what's interesting about what happens after the Jewish people experience liberation is that God gives a series of, of laws, many of which have to do with interpersonal behavior, and some of which have to do with the responsibility toward the ger, toward the stranger, the sojourner, somebody who is not from our community but is living among us. 
it would be very easy to imagine a situation in which the people said, OK, we just got out of a situation of being oppressed by another people. We were strangers in this land. And so forget everybody else. We're just going to protect ourselves. But actually, that's the very moment that God says, no, now that you have experienced oppression, you have to be hyper aware of those who are vulnerable in your own community. And then finally, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as President Carter said, was one of the world's responses to the Holocaust and to World War II. And it was the world's attempt at saying that what happened to my community, what happened to others, shouldn't happen again. This is aspirational. We have not yet fulfilled the hopes of that declaration. But it really is a sacred document. It's the world coming together and saying, this is what we aspire to. This is what we hope that every nation will live up to. And for, for my organization in particular, we look to that declaration as a core Jewish document of our time, a modern Jewish text, because it was in large part a response to our own tragic experience and because the experience of our history tells us that that history now imposes obligations that we have to take that document forward. Thank you, Rabbi. Imam Omar. So I mean, with the personal story in particular, um, a lot of my work reflects in my own personal journey and trying to struggle not just with faith but with overall identity. Um, the institute, that uh, Yafin Institute for Islamic Research, focuses on inspiring contribution through conviction. It sort of pushes back on this idea that the more devout you are as a Muslim, the more dangerous you are to your society. But more in the Quranic conception, which is that the more devout you are as a Muslim, the more beneficial you are to humanity. And that a conflicted American Muslim identity isn't good for anybody. And a lot of times as we struggle, and I, th I think we'll get to uh, our political polarization, there's this idea that we have to accept either a certain definition of American to be American Muslims, a very, a very narrow definition which sets a different threshold for patriotism for us as American Muslims, or you know that, that M on Muslim has to be lowercase. So you've got to relinquish a core, a part of your identity because society has derived certain conclusions about Islam on the basis of hate mongering and on the basis of a very targeted campaign that's been particularly vicious after 9-11. So you have to accept those conclusions and relinquish those elements of your faith rather than stick to them. Growing up, uh, it was conflict our entire lives. My parents uh, were both um, you know, uprooted. They were, they were from Palestine. My mother and father actually met at U of H at the University of Houston, so they both had their journeys to Texas, where I live right now, but I'm not a Texan. I'll get to that in a moment, uh, just as a qualification there. Uh, my parents met at U of H. They both had very unique journeys, but they both really had to fight and to struggle to exist because they had no homeland, or their homeland was taken from them. They had no family to connect to. They had no one to support them in their education. My dad literally had the story of showing up on a bus uh, in Houston and getting a graveyard shift at 7-Eleven, not speaking a word of English. And now he's a distinguished professor in chemistry at a HBCU. And you know they, they embodied struggle and being able to overcome any obstacle. And then my, my mother, you know, may God have mercy on her soul, struggled with a lot of personal uh, issues in terms of health, um, you know, cancer and, and the likes. And I saw faith power them through that. And not only did it power them through their unique struggles, it made them more loving to each other, it made them more loving to us, and it made them better people to humanity. And so they were able to overcome any struggle or obstacle that came their way. So the personal side of this, I mean, you know, growing up, we, we had a story of, uh, of struggle. We had a story of witnessing, you know, my, my dad threw David Duke out of a mosque way back then. It's nice to see him resurface to relevance, but <laughs> that's another story maybe we get to later on. We had a story of our parents um, giving away our car to Somali refugees, coming home and finding <coughs> refugees from Bosnia, wielding a hammer for Habitats for Humanity. That was our story growing up. And what that speaks to in the faith, in particular in Islam, which sort of ties my work in, 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 is in conviction and contribution, is that God describes faith as a tree in the Qur'an. And he says that its roots are firm, and its branches are high in the sky,
and it's in constant production of fruit. What that means is that if faith is rooted deeply in the heart, the greater awareness you have of God, the greater awareness you have of the humanity that's around you. And if you are, you know, in the Quran, if you're standing, there's a, there are verses about standing up and praying at night. Every time God talks about prayer at night, he immediately connects it to charity in the day. And what that speaks to is that if you're paying attention to God when other people are not, then you're paying attention to people when other people are not. And your branches being high in the sky provide shade to humanity. What drew me to that was that constant connection, uh, the coherence of understanding the oneness of God and the oneness of humanity, the fullness of the Abrahamic tradition in that sense. God describes uh, the prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, in the Quran as a, a nation of good, that he was an entire, it was as if he was a nation because of the good that came out of that one man. God describes Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in the Quran or quotes him rather, that he made me blessed wherever I may be, and that he carried with him goodness wherever he was. He changed and transformed wherever he was. And finally, the description of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as rahmatan uh, lil as a mercy to all of the worlds. And so what drew me to that was that constant connection being made, and Islam having a very explicit anti-racism tradition that drew in the Malcolm X's of the world. I did a uh, a class on the 40 hadiths, 40 sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on social justice. And when I covered things like environmental justice or animal rights or human rights or whatever it may be, I never had to struggle to find an explicit text. If anything, I had to narrow it down because it was so explicit, it is so explicit in the divine revelation that everything around you is assigned a God-given presence. And it's not even spoken about in terms of rights, but a God-given sanctity. And you have to honor that which God honored. Thank you so much. Those were beautiful reflections. Wow. Yeah, beautiful for both of you, from all three of you. And now I would really like to take the personal and bring it into our public <clears throat> expressions of our commitments to human rights. Really, you know, our country is deeply polarized at this time um, in politics, but as well as religion. You know, and the question really is how can we stand firmly for human rights? at this time, relying on our faith as a source of authority and moral courage, but also to bring others with us in community. Because do any of us doubt that if the armies of believers were to decide that we would have just immigration reform, a just peace in Israel, Palestine, an end to the war in Yemen, uh, universal health care for all, that we would have it? If the armies of believers would reach deep in all of our faith traditions, something tells me we could mobilize for those things. So that's my question. How do we, with our faith and bringing others of our faith into this, these, this campaign for human rights, how do we do that? How can we do that? Well, we have you know, certain uh, principles that guide us that never change. My high school principal used to say, we must accommodate changing times, but cling to principles that never change. So I think every, every individual in here and in our country and in the world has certain principles that we cling to, that we choose ourselves. Some of us emphasize truth. Some of us emphasize um, benevolence. Some of us em emphasize equality. Uh, some of us emphasize democracy and freedom. Some of us emphasize religious faith as such and a belief in God. But we all choose a certain number of those things, and that's what we believe in. I would say that, that our country, which is supposed to be a nation under God in the visible with liberty and justice for all, uh, has quite often fallen down on that premise. Uh, we have, uh, in recent times, at least I'd say in the last 15 years or more, uh, departed from some of those principles that used to guide us along with other countries that were basic principles on which the Universal Declaration was uh, founded of, of human rights. Uh, we adopted a policy of, uh, of being okay to torture people. And we disavowed the Geneva Conventions uh, we began to spy on Americans and, uh, and do away with some of their um, privacy. Uh, 
Uh, I won't go into detail about that, but we also have seen a, a tremendous increase. Well, since I left public office, we've had a seven and a half times increase uh, in the number of people in prison. We have more people in prison now than any other country on earth. And, and a lot of that is because uh, the poor people that are in prison are either, are either that, that is poor, or they're African-American, or they're Hispanic, or they are mentally retarded, or, or mentally have some mentally, mental affliction. Uh, these kind of things are, are very troublesome. We've also determined lately that uh, the truth is no longer a, a, a measuring of a, of, a, of a human being, and, and it's no longer to be prided. Uh, we've turned against uh, treating immigrants as, uh, as welcome guests in our country if they come in legally and things of that kind. So, so we have, we've, 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 we've gone a long way toward uh, violating some of our basic principles. And, and those principles, I think, are based on both democracy and freedom and the principle of the United States of America and on any particular religion that we, that we have. I, I would be bold enough to say that, that all of us here on the stage are children of Abraham. Uh, when I was at Camp David with Begin and Sadat, all of us were deeply religious. Uh, Begin was probably the first prime minister in Israel that was deeply religious. And Sadat had a, a brown spot on his forehead where he had spent his, his entire life bowing down in prayer with his, with his forehead on the ground. And, and I think that one reason we were able to reach an agreement there was because all of us had the same basic faith as, as children of Abraham. So we have so much in common, uh, and, and I think that, that what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has done is kind of encapsulate those in some very simple uh, paragraphs. They're very quick. You could read the whole 30 paragraphs in five, in five minutes, but, but they show us that, that, that the basic principle is to treat each other as equals and not, and not as superior people. So I, I think that's, a, that's the basic thing is, is our two, one is religious faith, the other one is faith in, in certain secular principles like democracy and freedom. It's certainly true that our country is more polarized certainly than I've seen in my lifetime. And when we think about politics, people usually immediately think about everything that they don't like about politics, whether it's the nasty campaigning or whether it's the kind of politics where you're really just screaming slogans at each other. And the thing about human rights is it should be apolitical, it should be nonpartisan, and it should be based on values and morality. And that should be able to cut through particular political positions. We should be able to agree, for example, that everybody should have health care that everybody should be able to make a basic living. Then we can argue about what the details are, but the goal is for us to agree on those basic principles and then figure it out from there. We're not there yet, but that, that is the goal. And in our conversations, I think that it's important to speak from a values perspective, and religion certainly can help with that, that when we speak from religious texts, from our religious traditions, in my experience, certainly people listen and are able to have conversations that they can't have when the conversation or so-called conversation is just about screaming political slogans. And as we all know, the, the power of personal experience and encounters with other people, there, there's no parallel to that. That right now, we're, much of our politics is driven by so much fear and by a sense of scarcity, that if somebody else succeeds, then that must mean that I'm failing, that as opposed to thinking about all of us moving forward together. And we know, of course, that when people in our communities have experiences with others who don't look like them, who don't pray like them, who maybe don't have the same first language, that suddenly they're talking to a human being. And we've seen this particularly in the last few years around the, the issue of immigration. Now, of course, there are still many people in this country who want to seal the borders and not let anybody in. But we've also seen so many attempts to reach out and to try to understand the experiences of people who are coming here as immigrants. So we've seen, at Truah, we've seen more than 70 synagogues that have decided to become sanctuaries, that they've committed to protecting immigrants who are at risk of deportation. And that's, that's brand new. We've seen the responses to the horrible images of children and families being tear gassed at the border, that suddenly people who look at those pictures, it's not just 
the theory of immigration or big questions about what comprehensive immigration reform looks like, it's a mother with a baby in her arms. And it's hard to look away from that. And I think that some of those images and even better conversations and relationships that are developing within communities, particularly within faith communities, because so many faith communities have stepped up either as sanctuaries, as taking in refugees, working with immigrants and refugees in their own communities, that those relationships can break through much of the rhetoric. So you mentioned um, authority. And I think that the separation of church and state as a discussion requires a discussion in of itself. But there's a saying <coughs> from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that the church is not meant to be the master nor the servant of the state, but its conscience. Not, it, it's meant to be its guide and its critic, not its tool. And so the church, obviously, by extension, religion, what role does religion play in regards to authority? Uh, and I think by authority, we can also extend that also with political candidates, not just people that are already in office, not to become tools of politicians, whether they are in office or whether they are in candidates, but rather the integrity of religion. Well, when you talk about authority and you talk about morality and you talk about where society stands, morality requires a strong definition and it requires a place in society and religion plays a role in defining what's moral in society. But religion has to maintain credibility by not being so blatantly hypocritical. So there is a, there is a role, um, you know, power, if power does not have the check of morality, then it becomes tyranny. If uh, freedom does not have the check of morality, it, it risks becoming depravity. So it, it has a role to play. I think that when you talk about the role of religion and power and that independence and religion with political candidates and defining a more comprehensive morality, if we are to say that we have timeless principles, principles that can resist temporary shifts of power, principles that can re resist temporary uh, shifts in societal trends, truly timeless principles, what does that look like in resisting becoming as polarized as our politics has become? Now, there has been an erosion of the religious middle. It's not just the political middle. There has been an erosion of the religious middle because essentially, because religion has become so politicized, you have to make a choice if you want to stay in your church, stay in your synagogue, stay in your mosque, you have to make a choice, and that choice is usually going to be highly partisan. So how do we push back on some of those things? Well, for one, where there is universal good, I think that religion can help us uh, set ourselves apart in terms of the zeal that we bring to working for that universal good. So people that, that rely on faith, that draw from a reservoir of deep faith, work in accordance with that faith in ways that are, uh, in, in ways that are unique, in ways that are particularly energetic. So we, you know, I don't think that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would have achieved what he achieved had he not been a person of deep faith. I don't think that Malcolm X would have achieved what he achieved had he not been a person of deep faith. I think that Mother Teresa set herself apart because of her faith, or, or she drew from a place of faith. I think a person who's not as well known, but Abdul Sattar Idhi, in Pakistan, set himself apart, drawing from a place of faith in his humanitarian work. So where there is good, universal good, you set yourself apart by drawing from that reservoir. Where there is evil, you set yourself apart, uh, where it's a clear evil and, and, and fighting that evil. I don't think Muhammad Ali would have stood up the way that he stood up had he not had a place of faith that he could draw from. And then where there is ambiguity. Where there is ambiguity, we have to maintain consistency. If we resist the temptation to become drawn into a particular political platform and be values-based, then when we talk about morality, we can bring a moral perspective to both how the child in the womb is treated as well as the child in the cage at the border. We can bring a moral perspective to both pornography and poverty. We can talk about these things that are so divisive and we can bring that consistency and not shy away from offering a comprehensive and consistent answer. If we are consistent on where we stand on something like torture or war or militarism, uh, we are not going to, uh, we're not simply going to speak out on those issues when the president, the particular president that's in power is someone we don't like. Immigration has been a broken system for a long time. 
uh, we've had a militarism issue for a long time. So uh, we've had a torture issue for a long time. We still have not resolved Guantanamo Bay. The images of Abu Ghraib in Iraq still never had a true, uh, a, a true form of reparation. So where's the morality on that? And, and how do we actually maintain a consistency across administrations and across issues and say we're drawing from timeless principles, no matter what issue we are discussing, and they all fall in accordance with the dignity of a human being and how a human being should be honored. Well, that's a, a perfect segue to what we'd l I'd like to bring this back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the idea that the, this set of principles was, as President Carter said, is one of these moments in human history that we can be so proud of where we said these the state will do and not do. The state will not torture. It will respect freedom of expression. These are commitments. They're very specific. It also includes a right to an adequate standard of living, uh, water, sanit clean water, housing, etc. So these are very specific commitments that were made um, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and then again in 1993 at the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights by you know, many more governments than were there in 1948 with the declaration. So this is a consensus among governments, yet we are so far away. So here on the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, since World War II, we have to ask, we're here in America, this is our country, we're all here, we're in this struggle together, you know. Um, and the US in the past has influenced the, the establishment and the enhancement of global norms. It was Eleanor Roosevelt who represented the United States uh, in the negotiation of the UDHR. Um, you know, it's, it's, we have a strong tradition here. In fact, the, the UDHR was, a lot, a lot of it was based on the American Bill of Rights, so we should have great pride in that document. Um, so, you know, now with uh, this erosion of human rights both at home and abroad, what do we really need to do to get ourselves and our country back on track? Uh, when I say back on track, it's not like human rights was great before 9-11, but after 9-11, it was like we were really trying very hard. There were improvements that were coming about. We were committing to end torture. We were committing to bring about equality of women and men. Uh, we were, and the end of indefinite detention and all of these terrible abuses. And then after 9-11, it was like a graph was going up and then 9-11 happened and respect for human rights went precipitously down. And now governments around the world have followed the American lead. Torture is back. We even had a journalist brutally murdered inside a consulate in uh, Saudi, the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, almost just unimaginable a few years ago that this could be uh, countenanced. So how do we get back, let me say, not to where it was perfect before, but back to an upward trajectory where we're increasingly seeing progress on human rights? Um, President Carter, do you have any <laughs> ideas? What can we do? How can we get back on this track? Well, <clears throat> I think I began my rambling remarks tonight by saying that I worship the Prince of Peace. I think the essence of it is peace. It's a basic human right. And the United States has, uh, has been by far the most warlike country in the world. Since the Second World War, we've been at, at, in active combat against at least 30 countries. And since 9-11, we've been involved in Iraq and Afghanistan now for 17 years, I think. It's the longest lasting wars. We used to end wars in about four years, no matter how bad it, badly they they affected people, but we used to get them over early. Now they just go on and on. So I, was, I think that one of the main things to remember there is that uh, our co government wouldn't go to war and stay there unless the people basically supported them. So we need to, to make sure we implement our basic religious faith in opposing war. It, it has a, a direct adverse impact on, on the well-being of people. Uh, for instance, uh, China hasn't been to war since 1979. And uh, China has 14,000 miles of uh, high-speed railroad finished. We don't have a single mile. Uh, China's building uh, new universities every year. We very seldom have started a new university from scratch that was functional. 
Oh, they have all of their bridges and, and highways in good shape. I'm not bragging on China in particular, but I'm just saying that to avoid war, China has been able to take trillions of dollars that we've spent, say, in just Iraq and Afghanistan and spend it on their, their own people's needs. Uh, in just, a, I'd say, four or five years, China will do away with extreme poverty in the whole country. Uh, that's something that we don't, not even there. I think half the people in the United States are now in poverty, according to the you know, World Bank figures on definitions. So I think if, if we could just commit ourselves as a nation to implement the teachings of Jesus Christ and not go to war and not fight each other, that would get, open the door to a lot of improvements uh, in, in basic human rights as far as uh, you know, the rights of, of women, the rights of poor people, the rights of, of those in prison and so forth. So, so that would be my, my single contribution. I, 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 I've, I've been learning a lot by listening to the other two. So, so I, freedom I hope, from fear and yeah, violence. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start with what you just said about freedom for, from fear, because as we know, when people are afraid, they're very, very willing to sacrifice other people's human rights and civil liberties. And that's what we've seen after 9-11 and and right now that much of the response to immigrants, to refugees, is coming from this place of fear. So we need to figure out how to break through that, which is not easy, but I think it's important that we have a discourse of human rights all the time, not only when things are really bad. As you said, there, human rights were not perfect under the last administration or under any administration before that, but now people are paying more attention, and if there's a silver lining, it's that people are paying more attention. I'll say also that 70 years in the scope of human history is not actually a very long time. So we might look back and say, how come we haven't achieved this beautiful vision of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the last 70 years? Well, I come from a tradition where we're mourning the destruction of a temple almost 2,000 years ago as though it happened yesterday. So 70 years is like a minute. It's, it's nothing. And so we shouldn't give up after 70 years. We should give it at least another 2,000 or so, see how things go. So we, but we certainly can't give up. And the final thing that I'll say is that when I started as executive director of TRUA, and I would say to people, we work on human rights issues, both in the US and Canada, and also in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, people would say, OK, Israel, I get. But what human rights issues are there in the United States or Canada? Because a lot of the issues that were on people's minds Many people would, would classify as social and economic issues, social justice issues, but not necessarily human rights issues, because often we think of human rights issues as Geneva Convention issues, as issues that have to do with, with war, which, of course, those issues have always been live in the United States, certainly in, in the past, what is it, 18 years, almost, 17 years. But that's, it feels very far away. Most of us aren't grappling with those, aren't seeing what's happening in Iraq and Afghanistan every day. And so we don't think of what's happening in the United States sometimes as human rights issues. But we have to talk about the human rights crises at home and talk about what's happening here as human rights issues and also connect it to what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's something else that perhaps is a silver lining right now as we're seeing the rise of autocrats, as we're seeing the attacks in democracy around the world, we can recognize that it's the exact same playbook that's being used here, that's being used by Putin, that's being used by Orban, that's being used by Netanyahu, all of these leaders who are attacking human rights and democracy in their own countries. And we have to recognize that we can, first of all, we can learn from people who are standing up for human rights in different places. And second, that we have to address these issues as a worldwide crisis and not just in a vacuum in our own countries. Um, I think I'd like to address it from a, another perspective, you know, I, I, speaking from a very unique vantage point, which is uh, being you know, from the Muslim world, because every Muslim represents all 1.8 billion of us in our acts, and so <laughs> everything we do, you know, uh, which really plays out bad with mass shootings in the country because you get like 380 of them, and then one of them is a Muslim, and we're going to be good for one or two idiots a year that's going to just, you know, taint the entirety of our body uh, around the world. But I'd like to just speak to about, you know, in, in this particular regard, how we deal with the rest of the world. Uh, 
uh, when we talk about bridges of understanding. We, we've spoken about polarization in our politics in regards to the national scene, people becoming more isolated and allowing for um, media and politicians to color the world around them. And the polarization has reached a level to which that means your neighbor who you never talk to now, right? So coloring the world around you through these things. And I want to speak to that element because if we can't even get our neighbors right, how are we going to get people across the world that are some existential threat to our way of life and our civilization right? And human rights discourse in particular, I think, can become problematic in being weaponized for imperialistic and capitalistic uh, uh, gains. And I'll, and I'll talk about that for a moment. A document is important. A document, at the end of the day, is hostage to those who interpret it and those who implement it. And so if the United Nations is hostage to those who fund it or hostage uh, you know, to a veto, to an American veto, then it becomes only a branch of American internationalism. And that's deeply problematic because selectively applying human rights discourse is, you know, is very unfair. And it leads to the constant polarization, not just of Democrat from Republican, we're talking about from West from the East, right? You know, polarizing these two worlds and, and giving into this idea that there's this clash of civilization that exists out there. How we push back on that is very important. I think it's, it's important for us to understand that using human rights discourse to continue to feed into this idea that one part of the world is regressive, backwards, in need of taming, in need of our uh, saviors to go out there and to free them. And that's why we're going to put trillions of dollars into the Iraq war. Oops, no weapons of mass destruction. But guess what? Now they have movie theaters. So they might have lost hundreds of thousands of people, but we freed them. Freedom in the language of self-determination is being lost. And that's actually in, in the history of the UN Charter, looking at the Atlantic Charter a few years before that, which emphasized self-determination. Uh, I think really sp spoke to something, obviously evolved and became part of broader discourse, but this idea of self-determination, this idea of a people being able to define themselves. And sometimes when we try to tame the world, uh, we strip national communities, faith communities, people of agency because we project our notions upon them that have very flawed underpinnings, but not the same realities as us. So I think you know uh, what, what President Carter wrote uh, in the aftermath of the Iraq war in 2003, I thought was very uh, powerful. He said, you said, President uh, Carter, that the Iraq war didn't meet your threshold as a Christian uh, for a just war. Now to the American mind, too often, because freedom to us is restricted to expression as opposed to self-determination, which is really what a lot of people are seeking in different parts of the world, and sometimes are suffocated by dictators that we back and that we allow to suffocate those legitimate calls for self-determination. A lot of times to us, we justify some of the harm and the damage that we cause in different parts of the world, and that's part of the moral conscience of the state. We have to be willing to tell our country the truth, that we have to do a better job. We, can't, we, cannot, we cannot absolve ourselves of our own human rights violations. Uh, we can't talk about freedom when we have the largest incarcerated population in the world without owning up to that. We cannot talk about self-determination or freedom in the language of self-determination when we back dictators and shut down people's legitimate aspirations and then use expression and you know, this idea that, well, we have to save them as, as, as a justification for war. And that in particular, you know, that, this idea that we can forgive and overlook our own violations at times because we can say, well, at least look, you know, this guy is championing freedom because he opened up movie theaters and guess what? They're playing the Avengers now. Yeah, but he's also acting like the villain off of the Avengers and torturing political opponents and where's the human rights discussion in that? So being more wholesome is important and understanding, building bridges of understanding, let's make a better effort to understand the world around us, to understand their lifestyles, to understand, to give them the agency to explain themselves to us as opposed to always portraying them in a certain way.
that makes it forgivable when we destroy their economic and political infrastructures while we could be spending that money at home, at home on health care and on clean water in Flint, Michigan. That's right. And uh, President Carter mentioned about half of the country living in poverty. There's a new definition or a new expanded report that's been championed by the Poor People's Campaign that raises the number of people in poverty from what was 30, 40 million to 140 million people in the United States when you uh, and slightly enlarge the definition to put people who are just a paycheck, just barely away from homelessness and total destitution, 140 million people in our own country. Um, so yes, this and is, uh, didn't, it wasn't a crisis as what you do to the least of these you have done unto me, right? I mean, so I know President Carter, you have said many times that if you are a Christian, you have to take care of the poor. Um, you know, I, and I think this is a struggle in our, system, in our society that we, we cherish capitalism. So we're going to have to reconcile the ideas around freedom. What does freedom mean when it comes down to it? And uh, that is challenging in this discussion because it has been much abused, the idea of freedom and what we are allowed to do um, to, to pursue it. Um, just one last question before we go to question and answers. Um, you know, a few years ago, President Carter, you raised the issue of women's rights as one of the most serious and unaddressed human rights violations no, through- The most. The most. Yeah. The most, yes, sir. Not one of the most. Yeah. The most. And we haven't discussed that tonight, but um, half of the world, a half of the world are, are deprived, and we see it with the Me Too movement and so many others that preceded it. To, to, to address it, uh, yet another book um, for you to, to seek out. Jim, uh, President Carter wrote uh, A Call to Action, Women, Religion, Violence, and Power. And in here, you, you talk about that. Um, you know, and women are a key to peace as well. We, you write about that in here. When women are included in decision making from the family to the community to the, glo to the world, we will see more peace. Uh, can we all just talk for a couple of minutes about how we can um, really advance this idea of women's equality. Um, Zaina Anwar once said, if women are equal in the eyes of God, why are they not equal in the eyes of man? Um, do you have any comments on this? Well, the Bible says that in, in the eyes of God, there is no difference between men and women. There's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. There's no difference between slaves and masters. And that just emphasizes the, uh, at least the New Testament, commitment to equality of all people. And I think that the ones that Jesus championed were the deprived people, the ones who had leprosy, the ones who were crippled, uh, the ones who couldn't see, the ones who were despised by society. And he emphasized the fact that all people are equal in the eyes of God. Uh, and he included women as well. I still believe that, uh, that every country on earth, including the United States, severely discriminates against women and girls. For instance, we support uh, slavery in this country. Slavery now probably exceeds in monetary value and, and human suffering what it did during the 17th and 18th, 19th, early 19th century. And um, Atlanta is one of, the, one of the exchange points for human slavery. One reason is that we have the largest airport on earth for passengers. And um, about 80% of the passengers brought in against their will and to be assigned to slavery conditions and, and prostitution and other things uh, are women, 80% are women. And whose fault? It's basically the men's fault. You know, when, when women are condemned for prostitution, it's the, it's the brothel owners and the pimps and the customers who make it possible. When women are accused of, uh, of promoting uh, abortion because they had to have 
you know, an end to a, a termination of a, a, ter a, a, a pregnancy that's, that's dangerous to the woman or that was a result of rape or slavery or incest. Uh, men are the ones who caused it, but, but women always get their fault for it. And as you pointed out, you know, I, I think it's no doubt that, that men are the basic originators of almost all the wars in the world. Not every one of them, perhaps, but I can't think of any exceptions to that. So, so, so you know, here we, we blame women for their problem. And, and one of the basic problems that, that we've discussed before is a, the fact that uh, it's men who interpret the meaning of the Holy Scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament, in the Hebrew Bible and also in the Christian Bible, uh, the misinterpretation of certain verses deliberately uh, introduced to, to accommodate men's beliefs of what caused women to be, to be deprived of basic principles because people can say, well, if, if the Bible says so-and-so, it's okay to, to make a wife subservient to a husband. Or it's okay to exclude women from the priesthood uh, and, and things of this kind. So I think that that's some of the things that we need to be worrying about is, is, is we could do away with the discrimination against women and, 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 and the fact that, that about a third of the women in America are subject to sexual abuse of some kind. And about a fourth or a fifth of the women who enter college are, are sexually abused before they graduate. And, and this, is, this is a blight on our, our country, and, and women don't have as much pay or anything. And, and I think, what, 5% or something of the, of the largest corporations in America uh, have women as, as CEOs, you know, where they're just as intelligent, just as competent as men. So it's a, it's a burning issue, and, and uh, it should be in the forefront of, of, of people's minds, including everybody here, by the way. Uh, yes, I think um, I heard a headline in there that uh, women's rights is a man's issue. It's Would a man's agree? issue, Would right? Do you agree with that? Because women, women are now speaking aloud a little bit yeah. more than they used to before. I've heard others say that, and I think it's so well said because there would be no unwanted pregnancy if there wasn't, uh, you know, right? <laughs> if there weren't a man involved. Right, that's there right. <laughs> so, but yet, yet the woman is there holding the burden. That's it's, right. I, maybe we could solve the abortion issue if we asked our, our fellow men uh, <laughs> to take responsibility for unwanted pregnancy. Uh, there's an action item. Um, okay, Re Rabbi Jacobs. Thank you. President Carter, I so appreciate your phrasing and your insistence that women's issues are the human rights issue of our time, and I couldn't agree more. And first of all, when we talk about women's issues, sometimes people think about issues that are put in that category of women's issues, whether it's reproductive health, abortion, violence against women, which are clearly crucial issues, but actually there's a gender lens on every human rights issue. So in my organization's work, we work, for example, on incarceration, and women who are experiencing incarceration have a different set of issues in addition to the issues that, that men are experiencing. And slavery and trafficking, of course, there are men and women who experience slavery and trafficking in our country and beyond, but their particular experiences, especially around sexual violence, are different. We could go on and on. For every issue, there is a particular gender lens that we need to put on it. The second piece is that, yes, of course, women's rights are, are men's issue also for many reasons, but also because we, if we lose 50% of the voices in the world, and that's 50% of the wisdom, that's 50% of the teaching that we could be learning from. So that's a loss for all of us. And certainly when we think about the sphere of religion, that for so many years we had men, as you said, interpreting religious texts in one particular way, and now thankfully we have women who are also religious leaders and teachers and academics. I, for one, am very grateful that that door was opened. I think about it, there's a, a very famous story in the Talmud in which a particular head of the Beit Midrash, of the study hall, had certain requirements for who was allowed to enter and, and not enter, pretty strict requirements. And then a new head came along and opened it up so anybody could come in. Now, by anybody, it was still men. But still, <laughs> in context, but so it said that they had to put out 
hundreds and hundreds of extra benches that day because the place was full. And it said on that day, some of the hardest questions were answered that couldn't have been answered before. So just imagine now that you brought in hundreds more benches for the other half of the people who were previously excluded. And now perhaps we can solve everything that we've been struggling with. So that's still something that we have to keep working on, bringing in all of those voices. So the, um, the attitude towards people, I think first and foremost, m many of these things are regional, not religious. You don't really find a great variation between the way that a woman is treated in a neighboring country in a particular region that has similar political and economic conditions. But uh, I think reshaping the attitude towards people. There's a very, I, I had the blessing of co-authoring a paper um, with a few of my colleagues uh, called Gender Equity and the Advent of Islam. And in, the title was actually, that was a subtitle, Gender Equity and the Advent of Islam. And the title was, we used to have no regard for women whatsoever. And it was actually a saying of, uh, of Omar, the guy I'm named after, who's the second caliph of Islam. He said that uh, we used to have no regard for women whatsoever until God said about them what he said about them and decreed for them what he decreed for them. And what he meant by that is our entire attitude towards how we viewed women, how we viewed our mothers, our spouses, our daughters. Of course, in that time, in, in 7th century Arabia, people used to bury their daughters alive. And that was one of the first things that the Quran spoke out against because a, a girl was deemed as being inherently of less value uh, to her family and to her society. So uplifting and elevating the human spirit and the sanctity of the human. There's a verse in the Quran, which I think could be a nice note for us to, uh, to, to, to kind of end off with on these, uh, on these things. But it says, Ya uh, Yohannas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha, O people. We have created you male and female, nations and tribes, lita'arafu, so that you may get to know one another. And verily, the most noble of you in the sight of God is the most pious. So what that meant was, Piety, which is the true standard of nobility in the sight of God, could be attained by anyone despite their gender, despite their race. So there's the condition in how we view the woman as a whole, and that's something that Islam emphasized, shifting the attitude towards women. Since we don't have too much time to get into the specific rights and, uh, and really just speaking to the legitimate grievances uh, that women have had, I think that education is something that we should emphasize. And uh, when we talk about uh, women's role in education in both learning and distri the distribution of knowledge, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but the first university in the world was founded by a Muslim woman. And Muslim women's scholarship started with the wives of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It was, uh, in Islam at least, the idea of a female scholar teaching learning, teaching, having just as, as uh, great of a right or an obligation and a right to learn. Um, that started off very early on. And so, uh, you know, I hate to break this to you all, but uh, the imam thing doesn't really exist. So we kind of just make it analogous. It's sort of like when I said I'm not a Texan, but I kind of am a Texan. I'm born in Louisiana, but I'm still a Texan in a way. Uh, the imam uh, in, in Islamic tradition, we don't really have a true clergy class. We have scholars and we have lay people. And if the scholars are endowed with some sort of position by state, they're judges, they're qadis. The imam is the person who leads the prayer. All right, so it could literally be if a group of people right now went out and started praying, the imam would be the one leading the prayer. But we use the term imam, means leader, uh, obviously to make it analogous. But really you have scholars and lay people. Uh, a great scholar, and I'll end with this, uh, Imam al-Dhahabi, who was uh, 13th century, wrote a book compiling the biographies of 10,000 Muslim women scholars over less than 1,000 years. And actually, there's a scholar from Oxford University, Akram Nadwi, who compiled those biographies, who's translating that wealth of biographies. And so when you, you uh, allow for uh, both men and women to have equal access and knowledge in learning the tradition and interpreting, that was something that was enshrined early on in our faith tradition, uh, then a lot of those discussions do not have to be revisionist uh, you know, 500, 600, 700 years later because women have been boxed out. And I'll also mention this, we have yet to have a female president in the United States of America. Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world, not, not an Arab country, surprise, surprise again. It's uh, not has, my fault, by the way. What's that? It's not my fault. It's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> we don't blame you, President Carter, for that one. <laughs> 
But that's just to say that we've, I think we've, we've grossly misinterpreted uh, the status of, 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 of women in Islam, and that's part of that Orientalism that uh, has peddled a certain notion of how women are viewed in the Islamic tradition. Well, well let me say one thing. You know, I think the most surprising and enthusiastic group that we've had to work with around the world on, on women's rights has been the imams. Uh, in, the imams in uh, West Africa and, and throughout Africa. And Karen can, can maybe take two or three minutes to testify about it, how many of them are, are so enthusiastic about having explained from the Koran how women should be treated equally and fairly. And, and this has been a, a very wonderful d delight for us and also very gratifying for us. Isn't that right, Karen? That's right. I, I won't take two or three minutes. I'll just say that um, okay. it, it's, it's really inspiring that when people see how their, how their faith, and in this case the Quran, aligns, and they look at it and they say, this is human rights, they become apostles and evangelists for, the, for human rights. And this is happening in Nigeria and Ghana. You can read about it on our, our website that we have found. And we hope to do more with Christian communities and, and Jewish communities and others um, to align human rights, per se, with faith tradition. Because it is very much culture. It's not faith, it's not from the text itself, it's culture. So helping to bridge those uh, gaps is very, very much part of our work. Thank right. you, sir. Um, so I, we only have about 15 minutes for questions and uh, we do want to get some in. Um, and I wanted to pick up, Omar, on your, Imam um, Omar, on your last uh, point earlier when you were talking about the weaponization of human rights. Um, so the question then is how, and this is for, for each of you, if you want to, oh, I'll get it, it's okay, mm -hmm. that's all right. Um, how can we balance between human rights and our interests, our national interests, mm -hmm. economic, military, to be maintained? To what extent must the superpowers intervene in a context where huge human rights violations take place Especially what if this context is in the case of an ally, like maybe you could add several countries in there. Um, so Imam Omar, but also President Carter, I'd like to know how do you balance? This is sometimes tricky. I'll be glad to let you go first for change. I, 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 I've never been in charge of a country, so I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> never been tasked with balancing out the interests. Uh, you know, I think just the, the um, you know, and I'd love to hear from President Carter what, what moral leadership looks like at the state level. Uh, you know, the, as, 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 as a person that's on the outside of government, it's very easy for me to point to um, double standards and to speak to the need for moral consistency, whether we're talking about torture, or immigration, or mass incarceration, or whatever, or poverty, or whatever that may be. I will say this, I mean, if, if it's not, you know, in the case of human rights discourse in particular, um, the way that it has been weaponized has fed into this notion that we have already mastered it. And so, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. Well, we've got to be honest with our own issues, and we have to be willing to look in the mirror and take ourselves to task and say, well, you know, what makes us great as a nation? What can we, wh what, you know, I, I found it very ironic uh, you know, that, that uh, the Iraq war was called uh, freedom. How do you free a nation when you destroy everything about its infrastructure? But, and and when, when, we're, when we say they hate us for our freedom, really? What freedom? Are we hated for our freedom or are we hated because we impede on the freedom of others and the true meaning of self-determination and the right uh, to come into the fullness of themselves? So when we say mutual interests, Mutual respect, mutual interest, does that mean as long as your interest aligns with or doesn't undermine our projects, international projects, then we'll let you have your aspirations. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just going to let you win these few battles and we're going to continue to say we are the moral police of the world. I think that it's important for us as Americans to say that we love our country and that does, that's not to the exclusion of the world. So my being an American does not exclude me from being a global citizen, just as my being a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew does not exclude me from being an American. I will love my country and try to advance my country in regards, you know, in ways that will truly make it better, but not conflate patriotism with nationalism, 
and not do so to the utter neglect of the world and say that, well, we have to protect our borders and that's why we can morally reason with this idea of dehumanizing a people Mm -hmm. to where we can either bomb them, fund the bombings of innocent children in weddings or in in, in school buses or even worse, cage them um, at our border. So I think that's how we have to, we have to reckon with our own cognitive dissonance mm-hmm. um, and, and do so very publicly as American citizens and say we reject this idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, we believe that the entire world needs to do better and here's how we're going to try to make our country better and by extension our world better. Okay. Sir? I don't think I, I can improve on that. <laughs> um, well, you know, almost all the wars we've been in for a long time have been unnecessary including, I think, Iraq and Afghanistan and Yemen and maybe even Vietnam and uh, Korea. I was, I was in the Navy in a submarine during the Korean War, and, I, and, I, and I, I tried very desperately after that to bring a healing process to, to Korea. I've been there a number of times. And, uh, and, and I, when I made a, my inaugural speech, I... I promised to preserve the peace and, and to promote human rights. And I tried to, and I was successful in doing that. But, but I had a, a lot of chances as president to begin a war. And I, and I would say in retrospect that had I begun a major war, I would likely be, have been reelected. Be, because, you know, there's a lot of difference between a, a, an embattled civilian president and the commander in chief in charge of our troops overseas who are dying every day because, I, because you cause it and so forth. We don't admit that. But anyway, uh, it's a very difficult choice to make. But I think that the American people have got to be committed to the principles of peace and human rights. And because when we give tacit approval uh, to a, 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 a leader who goes to war unnecessarily, like we've done so many times, I just mentioned a few of them, I think that's wrong. And, and we need to correct that, that problem. And, but it has to come from within our, our country itself. I think, I think uh, uh, if you'll let me have one more minute, I think our country has, uh, within our genes, I'll say, and included all three of us, uh, a kind of a self-correcting capability, because we, our ancestors, all came here at different times. Mine came early, and maybe y'all's later. But uh, and we came with a spirit of adventurism and entrepreneurship. We were able to to try new things in a courageous way to come to a different country and start a new life. And and we were successful when we got here by by using our own initiative. And and over a long period of time. Going back to what, what uh, the rabbi has said, you know, we try to look at things in 70 years instead of 2,070 years. Well, you know, we always fi- finally have corrected our, our major mistakes in America. It took us a long time to do away with slavery. It took a long time to get women's rights to vote. And, and, and it's, it's, it, you know, it's taken us a long time to do other things. But we've always been successful uh, eventually. And maybe that's because we have kind of an urgent within our genes to, to correct our mistakes. Sometimes it takes too long, I have to admit that. But, uh, but that's, that's one of the salvage, salving, saving things about America is that we eventually come out right. And, and we, 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 with our Constitution, originally, that all, we said men, all people are equal, created equal, and, and we have the rights that we've prescribed in our Bill of Rights and so forth. That was a, a, a wonderful signal to the rest of the world. That's, that's ancient times, but, but I think we still have that ingrained in us. And so maybe over a long period of time, we'll be correcting it. My, my Sunday school lessons this month are about uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah when, when the Israel, Israelites were in captivity in Babylon and they were finally, uh, finally saved by by uh, an Iranian, as a matter of fact, uh, in, in the end of 60 years or two, two generations. But, you know, I think that th- th- what I try to say to my Sunday school class is we have problems now in the world, a lot of them caused by the United States, but if you wait long enough, we're going to correct them. And I have faith in the future and hope.
Well, that's a very optimistic, I think we should end with that, but before yeah, we do, sure. <laughs> because I, we wanted some optimism, right? Some, uh, um, but before I do, I wanted to draw your, all of your attention to a new publication by the Human Rights Program. Today, on the anniversary of the 70th, 70th anniversary of the Declaration, uh, we've published this scripturally annotated Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, each article is accompanied by biblical text and commentary. Um, it does not provide any definitive analysis, um, but it hopes to encourage people of faith, Christians um, mainly, but it's both the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, to explore conversations and to initiate discussions. Um, and we have gifts for each of you of this new publication, but we hope you in the audience here and online will look for it on the Carter Center's website. Um, and the, the final, um, there's a question, but it's really just a request. Is there a common prayer of unity that we can use for attaining the peace in our daily work for human understanding and compassion? So I'd ask each of you to, to think of, of a prayer of unity. And I guess I'll start um, with the Baha'i prayer, very brief, for America that was revealed in 1912 by Abdu'l-Baha, a central figure of our faith who was a lifetime prisoner of the Ottoman Empire but came here in 1912. He said, O oh God, let this American democracy become glorious in spiritual degrees, even as it has aspired to material degrees. Confirm this revered nation to upraise the standard of the oneness of humanity to promulgate the most great peace, to become thereby most glorious and praiseworthy among all the nations of the world. I'll start uh, based on, on what you offered. I don't think that there's one prayer that we can or that we should all say. I, there's something that's very valuable in our diversity, in our different faith traditions. And when we try to have one prayer that all the different faith traditions can, can say, what ends up happening is we take out everything that makes each of our traditions special. And so I believe that we should each pray in our own way out of our own traditions. And I'll just offer, because you offered this, this Baha'i prayer, Jewish communities have for a very, very long time been offering prayers for the leader of whatever government we're living under. And we, we pray that, that this is, there's different versions of this prayer, but basically we're praying that this leader, whether it's a president or a king or prime minister, whoever it is, that they are going to do what is right and what is just. <laughs> and there are many conversations in many Jewish communities when the new administration started about how we would go about saying this prayer when we didn't have that faith that this was an administration that would actually carry out justice. And in those conversations, what many of us talked about was the fact that we've said this prayer or a version of it under some of the cruelest kings, under czars, under lots and lots of people who had no interest in, in justice, in mercy, in peace, and yet we keep praying it. We keep praying that, that they actually will find some enlightenment. And of course, it's not enough to pray. We also have to be doing the work every single day. And so we need, keep, we need to keep saying that prayer, whoever our leaders are in every moment, and then continue to also do the work so that we're not just relying on those leaders to do the right thing. Do you have, do you want to share it? I'll, I'll, I'll uh, there's try. Yeah. long text, so I'll, yeah, go ahead. You know, I think one of the things that we might pray for is that the United States be a true superpower not based on our military power and not based on our economic influence or even our political influence, but based on the fact that we are champions of uh, human rights and champions of peace and champion of, uh, of the environment and champion of equality among people and champion of welcoming foreigners to our shores. Those are the kind of things that we ought to be the champion of, in the eyes of the world. And uh, I would like for everybody on earth to say when they have a conflict in that country, uh, why don't we go to Washington 
and see how they preserve the peace. Or uh, if we have a problem with uh, human rights and they have a, an abuse in their country, why don't we say, have them say, why don't we go to Washington and see how they deal with human rights? We'd like to do the same thing. Uh, why don't we protect the environment uh, the way Washington does? That's what I'd like to see our country be a, a champion of human rights. And I think that's a good prayer, at least for me. You know, I, I, there's one, I was going through all the prayers in my mind, obviously, and so uh, there are many beautiful scriptures and prayers that could fit uh, the entirety of the Abrahamic scope and by, by anyone who believes in, in, in a creator God. Uh, there's one prayer that I think speaks to uh, something that we've all been hinting, not hinting at, but speaking about, which is that uh, a recognition that our decisions are very consequential, especially when we have positions of power, whether they're political places of power or whether they're pulpits, uh, places of influence. They're places of power, and they're places that have, that have great consequence. And each one of us has to recognize that, that our places carry great uh, weights of responsibility. And the consequences have led to a lot of... Uh, a lot of people in, in, in hardship, man-made, created disasters. And that's true whether I'm dealing with a Syrian refugee or someone that's in the streets of Dallas or someone that's uh, in, in, a, in a warehouse in, in, uh, in, in, at the border. So one prayer that's very special to me, uh, it's short, but it's very uh, comprehensive. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to say, Oh God, I asked you for the ability to do good, the ability to leave off evil and for the love of the poor. So, the, you know, the love of the poor, the love of the exploited, the love of the oppressed. Uh, if there's anything that we can do when we're talking about humanizing people, I think that each one of us needs to uh, reach deeply within ourselves and then do our part to acquaint ourselves with those that are suffering due to the various injustices that we seek to combat with our different places of influence. So I ask God that he allow us to do good, leave off evil, and that he place within us the love of the poor. Thank you. I mean. Very good. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have tonight. I hope you'll watch the webcast for our next conversation, The Delicate Art of Conflict Resolution, because we need peace, right? Yeah. <laughs> this will take place March 15th, March 14th, excuse me, 2019, and you'll find more details online. My thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. And please join me in a round of applause for our panel.